So Megan, welcome. Thank you so much. Just a quick, yeah, quick check that everyone can hear me. Okay, great. Um, it is such a deep honor to join you this morning. And before we do anything else, uh, I thought we might start with a brief practice if it feels available to you this morning. And like anything, if it doesn't, you can um, please feel free to make that choice uh, of no for yourself as we will talk about boundaries later. But for those of you that feel um, led to join me, I invite you to start by taking your right arm and then your left hand and simply doing some pats. Um, for some of us, gentle pat might feel nice. For others of us, a little bit more firm. You can decide the pace. And I invite you to pivot between noticing your arm and breathing in and out through your nose. And let's affirm, this is my arm, my right arm. It's nobody else's, it's mine. Go to the left side, affirming this is my left arm. It belongs to me. It's nobody else's. And maybe down to the top of the right leg and all the way down if that feels nice, giving it some love. This is my right leg. Carries me throughout the universe. It belongs to me. It's nobody else's. And then over to the left side. This is my left leg. It's mine. It belongs to me. And then coming up the body just gently to our head. Again, just affirming. This is my head. It's my thoughts, my creative energy, sensing into any vibration or whatever you feel. And then bringing a hand to the forehead and a hand to the back of the skull, breathing in and out through the nose. And when you're ready, allowing your hands to drop down. So here we are in this moment together. It is an honor to share this virtual space with you and your body. Um, I'd like to acknowledge, first of all, that I am a white, heterosexual, cisgendered woman. My pro pronouns are she, her. Um, because of this, I have been offered privileges and access that have been denied to so many other people. Um, and also because of that, I am a guest in your space. Um, so I encourage you to take what feels really relevant for you or maybe your students and please leave what does not. Because only you know what feels good in your body and your voice and no one is in charge of your body and your voice but you. That means even science. <laughs> I'm just going to dangle that one and leave it, right? Um, because you know what feels good to you. Um, so as uh, Matt said a bit about my work, and, and you may have read, I'm a voice teacher, a singing voice specialist, and a trauma-informed voice facilitator based in Louisville, Kentucky, actually. Um, recently uh, moved about a year ago from Pennsylvania. I was in the Lehigh Valley. So um, my blue, my, me and my husband's blue vote, not to make it political, but we, you know, we moved to the red state of Kentucky. So here we are. Um, so we, um, I've, it's been a joy to be in this area. I'll, I'll really have to start working on my um, mint juleps for you, Matt. I'll, I'll really get on that. Um, but I um, am really honored to speak with you today a bit about this idea of cultivating a supportive presence and what that has meant for me in my journey being a trauma-informed facilitator. Um, and if you are interested in more about this work, um, I can put my email address in the chat, but my email address is, um, well, I'll, I'll put it in the chat later, but you can feel free to please reach out to me. Um, but also you can find me on Facebook or Instagram. 
So what we're going to do today um, is because we will be talking about trauma a bit, um, I please, uh, please take care of yourself. Um, if you need to step away for any reason, if you need to, you know, um, for those of us that are present, if you need to, you know, um, take yourself away from the screen, uh, please do that. Um, and if you have a lot of feelings that come up after this, please find someone to process those, uh, those with, whether that's a trusted friend or um, maybe a mental health professional, um, because there is, there is so much heaviness in our universe right now. So um, I, I wish for you to find that own, your own supportive presence um, that, that can help you if, if that's something that you need. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen, hopefully. Wait a minute here, let's see. Okay. Do, do, do. Okay. Good. Okay. Okay, skip that. Okay. So some of our goals for today, we're gonna to talk a bit about the science behind the nervous system. Uh, some folks call it nervous system regulation. I tend to use the word nervous system support as Regulate feels a little stiff in some, in some circles. Um, we're gonna discover how sensing into our body's subtle cues of safety and danger can help us to cultivate boundaries and emotional intelligence. Uh, I think which is so important <laughs> as an educator, boundaries are really tricky right now, I think for a lot of us as students are literally in our homes um, in ways that they weren't before. And then finally, most importantly, exploring movement, breath, and sound practices for ourselves and certainly for our students that can help support our nervous system. And anything that um, I offer today are things that I often incorporate in a warm up, maybe between um, songs, like if I'm, you know, if we're going from a really um, emotionally intense song to something a bit lighter, some of these practices can help just bring us back into the present moment, which is something we're going to be talking a lot about today. Okay. So the first thing, what, it, what is trauma? Um, I really love this definition by neuro, uh, neuroscientist and researcher Stephen Porges. He says that trauma is a chronic disruption of connectedness. And that feels really relevant to me right now. Maybe that feels relevant for you. We are, we are really disconnected in, in so many ways. Um, you know, we're living in a time of sort of collective trauma where we've got a pandemic, we have historical, racial, and other systemic oppression, um, and trauma brought on by white supremacy. And we're, I think we're all really being mindful and noticing um, how those have impacted our musical world as well. Um, and not to mention individual wounds that us and our students may, may carry. Um, humans were made to connect, right? We have a biological imperative to connect, but in times of intense stress, our desire to make those connections becomes completely overwhelmed by our need to survive. Um, and this can often result in trauma. Um, another wonderful definition um, by Resma Menachem, if any of um, you have read his, uh, his seminal work, um, My Grandmother's Hands, um, about um, really racial trauma. Um, he says that in his book that trauma is anything that we experience as too soon, uh, sorry, too much, too soon, or too fast. So anything that's too much, too soon, or too fast. Um, it is outside of our capacity to hold. Um, and it isn't the event itself. So having a pandemic itself isn't the trauma. The things that happen to us themselves aren't trauma. The trauma is when our body is unable to move through or process those really intense situations. Um, we, we sort of get stuck in emotional patterns. Um, so those patterns, so for example, this is sort of a light example, but um, let's say one day, and we're going to refer back to this, if I'm um, on a safari and, and for whatever reason I'm being chased by a tiger, right? Being chased isn't the trauma. The trauma is the feeling after five years later, every time I go to run 
and I feel like I'm still being chased, right? So, so it's when it becomes those patterns stuck in our body. And maybe you're somebody um, for whom the word trauma, like you're, you're thinking, you're like, you know, I don't know that that word really resonates with me. Um, great, because not everything is trauma. Some things are just hard, right? Some things are just really, and trauma is a bit of a buzzword right now in wellness communities. Um, and I'm not gonna touch on that too much today, but but really knowing that not everything that is hard digs its way into our body, right? Um, but only you know, again, what feels like it could be trauma in your body. Um, and so maybe something like limiting self-belief resonates a bit more for you. How might limiting self-belief have taken hold somewhere in your body? Statements like, I'm not enough, or um, God, I, just, I feel so futile in my efforts during this time to try to communicate with people because I feel so disconnected. Um, or, you know, God, I just, I feel so unworthy. And maybe those statements, if you breathe them in, particularly I am not enough, that's a really common one that I'm hearing a lot lately. And certainly I feel in my own body. Um, if you breathe that in, often we feel a zap somewhere, maybe the heart center, or maybe like the abdomen, that sort of sickening feeling. So that and then tenfold, right, is sort of when these statements or these events start to live in our body. Um, so Stephen Porges, um, Dr. Porges, um, created a way for us to understand uh, how trauma gets stuck in our circuitry. Um, and, and so we're going to consider for a moment how the autonomic nervous system, uh, one, responds to sort of daily life stress um, and then move it into more traumatic stress. So the autonomic nervous system, um, and I'm sure a lot of us are already versed in this, but really, really briefly, we could think of it in terms of, in the most general sense, mood, um, energetic mood and then a calm mood. And we fluctuate at all times between these two states. You know, we, we're tired in the morning, we get out of bed, we have a little bit of energy for that, we have our coffee, we have a lot of energy for that, and then we have that sort of mid-morning crash, whatever that is for you, you know what those cycles are for you, but we're constantly cycling between them. When we're in periods of energy, we typically think of this as the sympathetic nervous system, um, which is so incredibly necessary for, for functioning, movement, awakeness, alertness, the process of inhalation. So think about this in terms of singing. When we receive breath, that's innately energizing. Um, anything that we do that mobilizes our body's resources is energizing. And I, um, we're going to talk, I'll probably say this till I'm blue in the face, um, but we need this uh, sympathetic side for life. We need it to um, for for activation. We need it for um, activism, which is so important. The tricky part becomes when we are overstimulated and the sympathetic nervous system um, is on hyperdrive and we, we feel restless, anxious. We start to feel completely overwhelmed or overstimulated. And in singing, this becomes when we start to gasp the inhale, right? Um, and I know I'm among choral directors, so I'm saying this with the, so much compassion, but one of the things that I often hear from singers is, you know, my choral director, when they, try, when they bring us in, they kind of go and they use the mouth breath. The problem with that is that it's sort of your fear of like, oh my God, please come in, <laughs> right? <gasps> please come in. And sometimes that is translated to, to the singers as, oh shit, oh, sorry, we've got to come in now, right? And so, it's, it's really interesting to be mindful about how our uh, responses are actually rooted in nervous system um, sort of dysregulation, even if it's a little bit. So again, that, that sort of gasping of the inhale um, is a really big one. Um, if we go to the calm side, um, the parasympathetic nervous system um, is sort of in two parts, and, and we'll talk about this more in a moment, but we think of the vagus nerve um, and the parasympathetic nervous system as, as sort of being um, sort of not one and the same, but, but they sort of go hand in hand. Um, and this is where Dr. Porges' work really comes into play. Um, so uh, the, the parasympathetic nervous system um, and the vagus nerve are in two parts. The ventral vagus we think of as rest and digest, which is actually everything above the diaphragm. So when the diaphragm up is activated, we feel like we are grounded. We feel relaxed. You're like, you, your head hits the pillow and you're like, yes, sleep and you're out. Or maybe in performance, 
you're, you're feeling active in a good way because we're about to perform, but you're also really grounded in the moment. That would be a great example of when the sympathetic and the parasympathetic are really mobilizing as one. Exhalation, right, is, is, um, is triggered by uh, when, when we go into this parasympathetic state, which is often why singing is so healing. Um, the flip side of the vagus nerve is the dorsal. Everything below the, di uh, the diaphragm is part of this dorsal branch of the vagus nerve. That's when we go into um, underwhelm or depression, feelings of complete separation, sadness, depression. In sound, we might have no vibrancy. We might have just no agency. And the big one here is feelings of hopelessness and futility. Um, when we just are so um, overwhelmed by, by that feeling of nothingness, um, so again, we cycle in and out of these feelings all the time. They turn into traumatic stress when they come out of our ability to cope, when they come out of our window of capacity to sort of, to sort of tolerate those, those feelings. Um, I just want to say a couple of things because we're all uh, voice educators here about how this really impacts the voice. Um, so it's an emerging research field of trauma and voice, but it there's a lot there's a lot of significant studies that reveal that our experiences really significantly impact um, the authenticity and efficacy of our sung and spoken communication. Now you probably don't need a study <laughs> to know this, right? You know that when you're stressed, your voice often feels um, tight tense, raspy, whatever it might feel for you. Um, I always have to read this study because I never get it right, but there's a study called Intrinsic Laryngeal Muscle Response to a Public Speech Preparation Stressor um, by Helu. Uh, if any of you know Aaliyah Helu um, out of, I think out of Pittsburgh, she's really brilliant, um, Kitty Bertolini Abbott. Um, they found that stressful experiences notably increase the intrinsic laryngeal muscles, right? So basically stress absolutely impacts the voice. Um, something else that's really interesting is in trauma, in, in really traumatic stress, often um, the speech and memory centers shut down. So often, literally, folks may lose their voice and be unable to communicate in those stressful situations and even years later. Another study conducted in 2019 at NYU um, investigated the subtle speech patterns of PTSD patients. And I'm just going to read this. Um, it's so fascinating. They, they discovered that patients with PTSD tended to speak in flatter speech um, with less articulation of the tongue and lips and more monotone. The researchers um, were kind of um, interested by this because they had thought previously that the telling features would reflect agitated speech. Um, but actually, when they saw the data, the features are flatter and more atonal. We were capturing the numbness that is so typical of trauma. We've known for a long time that you can tell how someone is doing from their voice. You don't have to be a doctor to know someone when someone is feeling down. So again, we already know um, this sort of narratively in our own bodies that it impacts the voice. Um, but there are a couple of things that I see a lot in my practice um, um, specifically for singers, and they may include shame, fear, uh, intense discomfort, discomfort with communication, including total voice loss, um, significant muscle tension. Um, and what's also really interesting about that is being unaware of muscle tension. Maybe you've had the experience working with somebody where they sort of look like this and, and you say, oh, you know, what might it feel like to go like this? And they're like, it doesn't feel any different, you know, and, and you're in your mind thinking, wow, you look really tight. But some folks don't actually, um, they're, they're, they're sort of in that numb state where that muscle tension is not available to them. They're, they're not aware of that. Or maybe they're not aware of how sound feels in their body. Um, you know, we often can put our hand here and feel vibration, um, but not everyone can, right? That sort of desensitization is really indicative of a lot of, chronic stress, um, in performance situations, intense performance anxiety, guilt over getting it right, pitch, pitch shaming, um, an inability to sort of phonate freely just because of a constant fear of being judged. And I think we've all been there, but in, in when we, when we have sort of these repeated patterns over and over and over in our lives, it really lives in the body. Hyperventilation, overbreathing, right? Taking in too much oxygen so that the body can't actually metabolize um, 
we actually need a certain amount of carbon dioxide in our body because carbon dioxide acts as a regulating hormone, which is really fascinating as singers to think about that we can overbreathe, right? Um, and then tasks can seem really overwhelming. I know a lot of us have had students where, you know, one student where it seems like a really easy task and then another student, it's just completely overwhelming. And a lot of that may have to do with traumatic stress, but depending on, um, you know, that student's um, background and lived experience. Um, and this is, if you take maybe nothing else away from today, um, let it be this. Students should never be made to feel shame for how their bodies have protected them in times of stress. I think, <laughs> I think often these responses, gasping the inhalation, not having enough breath, having sort of what we might you know, say is poor diction or poor articulation, we often label these things as unhealthy or poor vocal um, defaults, right? When actually they may be ways that the body has protected that person previously in threatening experiences. Um, and I think directly or indirectly, singers can feel shamed for how their bodies and voices have, have protected them. Um, they, these are habituated nervous system responses, right? They are often completely out of our control. So I think what, what often happens is that our body then becomes armored, right? Against those threats and those patterns just become, you know, part of our daily life and then certainly part of our singing life. So I think it's so critical to honor how the body has functioned as a fortress in those times of intense stress and threat, um, rather than, you know, oh crap. Hey, Megan, you're muted. Okay. Uh Better? <laughs> Great. Um, so where was I? Let's see. Right. So we'll just go to the slide. So, so how can we then honor that? Right. How can we say to ourselves, particularly as teachers, you know what? My voice feels really tight today. I'm feeling just completely frazzled. How do I honor that first and say, you know what body, thank you so much for protecting me. But right now I'm actually not running from the tiger. You know, I'm, I'm here in this moment. Um, how, how can we learn to treat those responses as, as things that are completely natural? And that's, I think that's really hard because our instinct is often to judge them. Um, so that's what I want to offer you a bit today is, is what are ways that we can come back into this present moment and honor, honor that, um, and then hopefully find small ways to move out of, out of those patterns. Um, this is a, another really great diagram, um, sort of based on uh, Stephen Porges's work about the window of capacity, or sometimes it's called the window of tolerance. So if you notice um, in that box, we have our sort of optimal arousal window. In other words, we got this. We totally got this. Anything that comes our way, it, when we are in this window, we feel that we are in this sort of what we call social engagement, or we feel connected. We might have a little bit of that activation going because we need activation for survival, but it's nothing we can't handle. The problem becomes when we come outside of this window, either hyper aroused, right? Where we have so much of that hyper vigilance or intrusive imagery, or just feel completely, um, you know, I have a 15 month old and sometimes when he screams, I just completely blow out of my window of capacity because of my body reacts so strongly to those high decibel levels, right? And then conversely, sometimes we slip into the hypoarousal zone where it's just, ugh, we, we feel like we can't get out of bed or we feel like that mobilization energy just is not available to us. And sometimes as teachers, that can feel really overwhelming when we have to go and, 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 and lead a rehearsal. Um, so just to wrap up this bit, the autonomic nervous system and traumatic stress, um, they, we, we might, it's not so much getting pulled out of the window that's a problem. We get pulled out of our window all the time. It's do we have resources for when those moments happen to be able to sort of bring us back into the present moment? 
those resources is, is what I want to kind of go into now is, is how do we, um, remind ourselves that activation is totally normal. In fact, calm may not be available to you right now, which is totally normal, right? Calm, you know, particularly in yoga, we're all like, you know, let's find calm, let's find a bliss state, but calm may not be available. And it's okay that it's not available because the, the whole idea of having a supported nervous system isn't to be Zen all the time. It's to have resources that help us to navigate these completely natural cycles of up and down in our nervous system. So inner resources. The vagus nerve, as we talked about before, is one of the most um, awesome, particularly as musicians, as singers, inner resource. What is an inner resource? An inner resource is anything that helps us to anchor to the present moment. It emphasizes wholeness rather than deficiency. Again, that idea of, yes, I'm feeling really maybe dysregulated right now, but you know what? That's my body doing what it's designed to do, right? I can honor that and then, you know, use some resourcing to bring me back into the present. Um, it, it also means probably most importantly for teachers that we become really aware of our current mood state, which may seem simple, but when you're w teaching, one of the most important things that you can do is simply be aware of how you feel in this moment um, so that we are able to compassionately relate to the people in front of us. Um, so the vagus nerve is often called the wanderer. Um, it's the 10th cranial nerve. It has many sensory and motor functions, um, but the most important one for us as singers is that it supplies the vocal folds with power. Um, it also regulates internal organ functions like respiration, digestion, and heart rate. Um, and again, it, it, when it is stimulated, um, it provides feelings of well-being. When we sing, again, one of the reasons, not only because we're prolonging our exhalation, which helps us to be in that uh, parasympathetic state, but when we make vibration, we increase our vagal tone. It stimulates our vagal nerve. And the more vagal tone we build in our body, the easier it is for, for us to recover after times of intense stress. So sound, again, is such an amazing inner resource because it grounds us back to the present and it helps to activate those feelings of well-being. So I invite us to take a hand. Um, I'm gonna take my right hand and just kind of go right up under my collarbone. And just three times, I'll invite us to hum and sense into the breath moving in and out of your nose. And then maybe if it's available to you, any vibration that, that you're able to sense into. Let's try three hums at our own pace, inhaling. And when you're ready, dropping your hand down. Inhaling to the crown of the head, I am. Exhaling to the soles of the feet, here. So just a small but incredibly impactful way to stimulate those feelings of well-being, to bring us into presence. What's so great about sound too is that it throws our thinking mind a bone. We often think in yoga, um, the brain is like a, a monkey swinging from thought to thought to thought, tree to tree to tree to tree. When we make sound, instead of those thoughts, the brain's like, oh, sound, 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 right? So we're throwing that thinking mind a bone all while activating that parasympathetic nervous system to bring us back into the present. So trauma, this is a great quote from Deb Dana, who's a polyvagal theory um, therapist. And um, trauma often shapes the system away from connection and toward protection. Because again, when we're in those states of armored, um, armored body, armored mind, um, it's really, really difficult to feel like we can make connections. Um, when we're regulated or supported, um, we can be a supporting presence for other people. But when we're dysregulated, dysreg there's a rupture in attunement and the other person's autonomic response will be an automatic move out of connection and into protection. A great example, I think of this as a teacher, is if, if you've ever been in a situation where um, you feel challenged from a student, um, 
you might notice how, how your body reacts to that, right? So we're constantly trying to connect to students, but particularly in times of stress, if you get challenged, right? Sometimes the jaw sets, sometimes the stomach, you get that zap in your core that says protect, right? Territoriality, I'm in charge, right? What, whatever that means for you. I have that all the time in my own body. If we can just start to notice those impulses, notice those protective instincts, because again, they're there to protect us from threat. They're not bad, right? It doesn't mean that I'm a bad person because I, you know, want to lash out. It just means that I can notice it and say, you know what, that impulse may be taking me out of my window of capacity to connect with this person. How can I notice it and take a step back into this present moment? And that's what this idea of co-regulation or co-support is about. How can we mutually create an environment of respect and re reciprocity so that we can support one another's nervous systems? And um, one of the best ways to do that is through literally becoming aware of what's happening around us in our body, so around us in sort of our, our external environment and inside our body. And uh, we've probably, um, you've probably heard of some of these before, call them sort of the exceptions. Um, these are um, ways, again, simply to connect us with ourselves and others. I think for teachers, it helps us to attune to our students' body language. If we can be aware of these things in ourselves, we start to see them more in other people. Um, and simply how knowing, for example, how fear, how protection feels in our body might help us to attune to how it feels in somebody else's body, which instantly creates those moments of connection rather than threat and protection. So exteroception is the body's ability to sense what's happening um, to it from the outside. So just where you are right now, you might dig your toes into your shoes or if you're barefoot, finding the floor, right? So finding your feet on the floor, you might become aware of the temperature in the room, how that feels on your skin. When we do this exercise, this is a container building exercise where we affirm, this is my body, right? This is my body taking up space. What does it feel like to literally put my hand on my arm? Proprioception um, is the body's ability to sense its own location or a movement in space. Um, if you've ever watched like American Ninja Warrior, those athletes have amazing proprioception. They just know how to sort of swing through the atmosphere. And I'm, you know, like, ooh, how are they going to make it? And they make it. So here's, here's a really fun proprioception activity for us. I'm going to invite us, if it's available to you, just kind of open your arms wide, stretch out. And you've been sitting, listening to me yak on for a while. So get a little stretch going. And then I'm going to invite you to bring both pointer fingers together behind your head without looking. So without looking, can you bring both pointer fingers together? Great. We're going to stretch out. This time we're going to bring both middle fingers together without looking. Okay. Good. Stretch out again. Let's bring right pinky to left thumb without looking. Right pinky, left thumb. Stretch out again. Let's bring right ring finger to left pointer finger. Right ring finger, left pointer finger. Getting a little trickier. Yeah, great. And then relax down. So proprioception activity, it gives our brain a job, right? It's a great present orienting activity. Just that little break. It just gives us a break, right? And it brings us back to, to this moment. Um, if you've ever again sort of hung upside down or sometimes if we forward fold even, that's a great proprioception building activity. It just scrambles our brain enough for a moment uh, to then bring us back. Um, interoception. This is the body's ability to feel what's happening inside of it. I'm hungry. I feel my breath moving. I feel my heartbeat inside of me. Um, I feel vibration moving throughout my body. Um, this perception may be really overwhelming at times or may be completely unavailable to us because sometimes going inward, right, can feel really intense. Have you ever had the sort of experience where you're like, you know, I just can't go there right now where we have this sort of outer shield up for whatever reason, and we can't go any deeper. For singers that I've worked with that have experienced intense trauma, um, going inward can be extraordinarily difficult. Even sensing into sound, as I mentioned earlier, can be either impossible or overwhelming. 
Um, and so one of the ways that we can learn to kind of navigate going in and out of these areas is something called pendulation or pivoting, where we might do something where, um, well, we're going to do it in a moment, where we ground to something outside of us like this, and then we become aware of breath moving in and out through our nose. So we simply pivot between what's happening here and what's happening here, or what's happening here and mm, a hum. So if, if you know that you're in a state of overwhelm, having a way to come outside of those intrusive thoughts or those intense feelings to ground us back into this moment can be extraordinarily helpful. So um, let's do a bit of a, a longer practice um, if it feels comfortable for you in tying these, these ideas together. So I'm gonna invite you to take your hands and I'm just gonna kind of wiggle them around a little bit. Yeah, great. We're going to start by bringing the pinky fingers together and just notice, maybe notice the pressure between the pinkies. You could look at your hands if that feels comfortable or look away. It doesn't matter. We're just becoming aware of the sensation. And then I invite you to bring your ring fingertips together same way, noticing the pressure, maybe noticing the muscles in your hands and noticing breath moving in and out through the nose. And then the middle fingertips together. You might notice that one feels different. Sometimes one of these can make your skin feel a little crawl. And let's shake that out. So we have the choice. You can either close your eyes or you can look away. I'm going to invite you to bring your pinky fingers together without looking. And then releasing that, maybe letting the hands go to the side. Let's bring the ring fingertips together without looking. And then releasing that, finally the middle fingertips together. And then bringing your awareness back to the space, opening our eyes. Let's go back to the pinky fingers. We're going to add a bit of sound. We're going to exhale on the sound, ooh, the vowel sound, ooh, with the pinkies. Inhaling. Ooh. Releasing, bringing the middle fingertips together, the sound, oh. Oh. Ah. And then letting the hands drop down by the side. So just a way to integrate both of those things together. Um, we don't have too much time to talk about those, but those are called mudras, gesture. Uh, gesture. Um, uh, we have over 17,000 touch receptors in the hands. Um, and if, if you're a yoga practitioner, you might be really familiar. There are, gosh, thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, millions maybe, uh, of hand gestures. And interestingly, uh, some mudras are connected to sound. And so, ooh, oh, ah. Um, we also connect these with the feet, the hips, and the abdomen midsection. We could do a whole other workshop on those, but just a really fantastic way to integrate what's happening outside of my body with something titrated, what's happening inside of my body so that people can pendulate between coming in and out at their own pace. Then finally, neuroception. Okay, so neuroception is your body's ability to determine whether a situation or a person feels threatening or dangerous. Do you ever get that feeling? Um, the quintessential example is in you're like in a dark alley or you're in an elevator late at night in an old building and somebody comes into your space and you kind of have that, oh, I don't know about this, that sort of, un, that feeling of, un, of, of unsafety. When we are in stress, traumatic stress, or, or just overwhelming stress, even if it doesn't necessarily feel traumatic, often our body becomes unable to sort of distinguish these cues. Either we're so overwhelmed that everything feels scary, or we're so desensitized that nothing feels scary. And we, our boundaries in, those, um, in that sort of situation can often get a little bit blurry because we're constant, constantly sort of letting in things that might otherwise feel threatening to us. So um, 
I'm going to invite you um, to um, kind of do a little bit of an exercise in neuroception. So I'm going to show a series, just a few pictures, and um, I'm going to invite you to notice in your body what cues of safety or danger you get. Maybe you get a little zap in your belly. Maybe your skin crawls, or maybe you get a feeling of well-being. Maybe you just, oh, like a feeling of warmth that radiates. Um, because our nervous system is shaped through interactions with other people, again, that idea of co-supporting, um, we're constantly asking, is it safe to connect with this person or do, do I need to protect myself from, from you know, this person? Um, we're constantly looking for these cues of safety and danger. And so one of the best ways to sort of get better at that is to literally sense into how our body responds, right? So just sensing into sensation. Here we go. They're a little blurry. So. So I know I did that rather quickly, but, um, and if we had, you know, time, I'd, I would be sort of curious how folks' bodies respond. For some of us, the image of the teddy bear might have been really soothing, like, oh, teddy bear. For others of us, it might brought, uh, have brought feelings of like loss and sadness. The snake, some of us may love snakes and think they're really cute. Others of us maybe got that feeling of danger um, and the same with that sort of creepy castle. Um, the, the whole idea of this is we, it is completely outside of our control. It's instinctual how our body responds and how our body gives us those cues. And just think about our students, right? Something that may feel totally simple and totally safe for us may feel completely overwhelming for a student who is in a, in a, in a, in a time of intense stress. The point is not to fix that, right? There is, this is why this work is so messy. We're not trying to fix anything. We're simply saying, how can we provide practices to bring folks, including ourselves, back into the present moment when we feel like those cues of danger are out of our control? When we feel like our body is so armored that we can't sort of regulate or find support. So co-support or co-regulation co in the classroom. So as teachers, we can start to attune to those sensations in our own body become aware of how our nervous system responds. Oh God, I get that zap in my stomach when I hear that word. Or sometimes that teacher walks in or that student comes in and I just know what they're gonna ask and I, oh, I feel my body doing that thing. The first step is just be aware of it, right? So that we can start to come back into that window of capacity. Because as, just God, the, the biggest, I think, um, uh, 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 way that you can be trauma-informed um, and just holding a, a supportive space is just identifying your own feelings. There is so much power in simply showing up and being present. That's it, right? Um, um, because the, out of that presence, we start to make more compassionate choices about how to interact with others and probably most importantly, interacting with ourselves based on those sensations that we receive. Great, how do we do that? <laughs> so we talked about that a little bit. Um, embodiment. Um, research indicates that trauma, you know, anxiety, depression, stress, it lives in the body as we talked about. And that um, bottom up processing, so like things like yoga, movement, um, Alexander, amazing, you know, Feldenkrais, a lot of acting based modalities talk about this. Movement, sound can be effective in reducing symptoms of traumatic stress rather than just talking it out. Sometimes we have those students that come to us and all they want to do is talk about a really stressful experience. One, we often don't have time, even though we want to provide a compassionate space. But two, often the student, talking doesn't always help, right? Sometimes it digs the wound deeper. And then we as the educator are left with the imprint of all of this stuff, right? So 
often practices like movements, those little sort of things that we did, sort of things like this can help cultivate a wider window of capacity without a lot of discussion because um, Bessel van der Kolk, one of the great trauma researchers, um, says that really talking doesn't make your body know that you're safe. Um, feeling how the body responds to cues, um, sensing into how the body providing space to, 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 to sense into how the body uh, responds is really the better way, resetting the physiology. Um, so what does it mean to embody? I love this quote by Jane Clapp, who's a movement for trauma educator. Embodiment is to provide with a body, period, to make corporeal, to embody a spirit. Embodiment can simply mean living in conscious awareness of our body in whatever way that is available to us. Um, so again, we're not trying to fix anything. We're not trying to move people out of their energy. We're simply saying we're here as educators. I'm here for you. I'm here in my body. Let me help you to be here in your body. Again, a supported nervous system is not necessarily calm. It's flexible, it's resilient, it has agency. It's able to mobilize and to still in those moments when we want sort of either to happen. Um, Okay, so some practices we're gonna do uh, to wrap up here. Um, and I, I wanna say this again because we're voice educators really quickly. So in trauma-informed care, um, we need to recognize that singers, that particularly singers, including ourselves that have been through traumatic stress, we can feel breath and sound moving in our body anywhere that feels safe. Um, or that feels, if safe, safe is, is a really tough word, so if safe isn't, isn't the right word for us, um, that just feels grounded. Um, in that way, we empower and honor the sensation that's happening. If you cannot find your breath for singing right now, this is really, this is really important. The diaphragm, right? Primary muscle of inhalation. When we inhale, it goes down like this, right? When we exhale, it comes back up. In traumatic stress or, or just stress in general, instead of being the primary muscle of inhalation, the diaphragm transforms into a core stabilizer. It is preparing your body to run away. You cannot take a deep breath in those moments. And as a singer, if you try, you're negating your body's natural. Again, it's, it's not a bad thing. Your body is doing exactly what it's designed to do, right? To protect you. It's just that in that moment, you might not be being chased by a tiger. You might just ha be having a little bit of stress or maybe performance anxiety. So again, I come back to, we have to learn how to honor that and de-armor that diaphragm, but in a way that says, you know, I, I love that my body is doing exactly what it's supposed to do in this moment. I don't need it to armor. Maybe I can allow it to soften, but we don't want to stigmatize um, how our body has, again, been armored in the past against threat. Okay, so I'm going to come back here. Stop share finally. Okay. So these practices are not meant for you to find calm or a bliss state or a zen state. These practices are simply meant to ground us back here. If you find calm, awesome benefit. But if you're like, you know what? I, I, I feel a little bit agitated, but I'm, I feel like I could take the next step. I think that's what grounding practices are here for. They help us to identify those cues of safety or danger so that we can create our boundaries and help us to de-armor the body, particularly the diaphragm, and then take whatever next step needs to happen. Okay, getting myself together. So let's um, let's see. Let's start with a bit of a. If you if if standing is available to you, um, you you might stand. Otherwise, seated is fine. It might feel nice to stand, even though since we've been sitting for a while. So I'm gonna invite us to start. So so what do we do? If we're feeling that tension, we're about to teach. Um, we're trying to lead our you know our singers through you know this Ave Verum Corpus. Let's say. And no one, everyone's breath is feeling disconnected. One of the hardest things to do is connect with your breath by saying, let's breathe deeply. Again, if the diaphragm is armored for threat, it probably won't do it. Movement is one of the greatest ways to sort of get that de-armoring happen. The, one of the, my favorite is um, shaking, okay? So I'm gonna start with my knees. Let me see if you can do it this way. So I'm gonna start with my knees and I'm kind of going like this. Just shaking it, yeah. Q Taylor Swift, I should have. I'm not, but I should have. So we'll just start with our knees, if that feels good. And then maybe it comes up to your hips a little bit. And I'll just give this a little space to shake, however that feels for you. 
and maybe pendulate or pivot between noticing the shake and noticing breath moving in and out through your nose. And maybe it gets a little bigger. Maybe you go to one foot and shake off the foot. A lot of us probably already have practices like this that we do. So again, we're not trying to deepen our breath or anything. We're not trying to change anything. We're just using the shaking and then coming back to breath, moving in and out through the nose. Nice, and then maybe we get a little bigger. And then when you're ready, smaller movements, noticing breath, moving in and out through the nose. Shaking moves lymphatic fluid in the body. Lymphatic fluid is cell, sort of like cell waste. Um, not, there's also evidence to suggest that shaking moves sort of emotional waste as well. Animals, after distressing experiences, they literally shake it off. After my dog has a bath, dog shakes it off. We don't tend to do that as humans. We tend to store that emotional waste, right? The shaking not only gets that lymphatic fluid going, but it helps us to process and sort of release some of those emotions, particularly if you have a lot of cues of danger in your body, helps us to release a bit of that so that the diaphragm and maybe the, muscle, the auxiliary breathing muscles up here have a chance huh, to come back into a, a feeling of mobilization and flexibility. Another really great one um, are sort of bilateral movements. So I'm gonna invite us to start by playing a little patty cake. So just wherever you are, this is kind of fun to do with screen. So just cross body. Nice. And then we're gonna go up and down little Saturday night fever action. And then from here, we're gonna take our body across here and we're gonna just kind of like we started, give a little pop. And then crossing the hands. I'm, I'm gonna invite us to go down to the legs if that feels available. Crossed hands, legs. And then up the body, kind of shaking it off this way. And then my favorite, we're gonna take the hands across the face and just do a little patting. Kind of tricks the body into thinking they're not your hands. And then this is kind of weird, but kind of fun. A little massage. <laughs> Brings us back into the present. And then down. And if you'd like, you can return to seated. Um, cross body patterning and bilateral movement. There's significant evidence to suggest that trauma, traumatic stress impacts the right brain a little bit more than the left. When we do cross body patterning, whether it's movement or whether it's padding, it helps to um, sort of rebuild the connection between the right and the left brain so that they can come together. Um, let's see, I just wanna check. I have till 1030, is that? Okay, great, okay. So after you feel like you've gotten a little bit of movement and you're, you're thinking to yourself, okay, maybe my breath feels a little bit more available to me, particularly if you were kind of in a state of, of hyper arousal. One of my favorite breath activities to come down to is alternate nostril breathing for a lot of reasons. And I'm sure a lot of us, um, you probably practice this at home. Um, and and you, if you have a particular way that you practice it, please uh, feel free to practice it your way. But for those of us that perhaps it's new for, I invite you to take your right hand. And we're gonna start by taking the right thumb to the right nostril. I love doing this with students because they love to say the word nostril. It's just a fun, it's a fun day. We're gonna start by inviting the breath in through the left side. In and out, if it feels available to you. And just notice, what does the breath feel like moving in and out through the nose? We can pendulate between noticing cool air, so that exteroception, and then maybe we feel it 
lower in our body. So any activity that uses a warm up can instantly be transformed into a suction activity by saying what's happening outside the body and what's happening inside. So that you're just providing a way for folks to come back to the outside if they need to. And then when you're ready, switching sides to the left, to the right side, <laughs> little mucus happening. And notice maybe if this side is different, singing is an incredibly interoceptive activity. We are constantly talking about inside the body, right? Feeling our sound, feeling our breath, feeling the muscles of the body. Again, right now, they, that might be very overwhelming. So just having something to come back to outside the body gives us an anchor to the present. Let's do a little bit of alternating. So we'll receive breath from the right side and then switch, exhale left. In. And then switch. In. And switch. And let's do one more, receiving and then giving away. And then when you're ready, Letting your hand drop down by the side. Nice. Breathing in through both nostrils. Affirming on your next inhale, I am. And then exhaling, enough. And bringing our awareness back to the space. So I could talk about nose breathing all day and I'm, I'm gonna go a little quickly here because um, I have some other things to, to get to. But for those of us um, maybe who, which is kind of show of hands, who uh, felt that their right nostril was a little bit more open to breathe through? Or maybe who's left nostril? Maybe some of us, it's like both. So when we breathe through the right side, it's actually energizing. Right nostril breathing, and if your right nostril felt more open, it might mean that your body's mobilizing a little bit. The sympathetic nervous system is a little bit more in, in, in gear. Conversely, the left nostril, um, tends to be more grounding. Um, I hesitate to use the word calming, but, but maybe more grounding. Um, what's fascinating when used in voice contexts, um, if you have onset, if you're, if you're working with a group or maybe an individual and they're having onset difficulty, meaning the moment of sound feels uh, a little bit scary, maybe their body is receiving cues that it is not safe to sing, right? Maybe, maybe someone has pitch shamed them so much and said, you know, your voice is flat a lot. That creates so much armoring in the body. When we receive breath through that left side, that starts to activate the parasympathetic nervous system, vagus nerve, right? So receiving breath through that left side as our breath for singing, maybe. <laughs> I've seen it do some pretty wild things for onset balance, because if you think about what onset is, it's that, it's that moment that the body says, yes, my vocal folds have permission to take up physical and acoustic space. And if our body is getting more cues of danger than safety, that that's not okay, it means that we're in that hyper arousal zone. So, so taking a moment to do some alternating breath helps that body to come into a space of groundedness a bit more. The other great thing, if any of us um, are familiar with buteyko breathing, um, B-U-T-E-Y-K-O, it's sort of the chemistry of breathing. It's really fin uh, fantastic work. I'm not a buteyko practitioner, but just a few things about nose breathing. When you breathe through the nose, it's the only way your body creates nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is created in your uh, paranasal sinuses, I believe. Um, nitric oxide does a few things. One, it's a vasodilator. So it's gonna open, open the blood flow. Two, it's a bronchiodilator. When you breathe through your nose, you're actually accessing the deeper part of your lung tissue. Um, it, it, it requires more muscular effort to breathe through the nose, um, but you're getting a more beneficial breath because the lungs are opening more significantly. Um, it is a, a neurotransmitter regulator, which means that it helps with anxiety. So breathing through the nose before a moment of singing. Now, look, in the middle of singing, when you're on stage, sometimes you have to breathe how you, how you have to breathe. There's often, you know, not a lot of time to nose breathe. But if you have time, it's a great way to ground to the present moment. Finally, my favorite thing about nose breathing in the time of COVID is an antimicrobial. Nitric oxide 
So because of its presence in your nose, when you breathe in dust mites through your nose, they die in like 10 minutes. When you breathe in dust mites through your mouth, they live for three to four months in your body. Ugh. So nose breathe. Um, if you're somebody that feels a lot of panic when you're wearing a mask, see if you can breathe through your nose rather than your mouth under the mask because it, it, it may feel really weird for a while because your body isn't used to it. I'm not gonna say that it's a calm feeling at first for some of us, but it over time, can help the body to produce more of that nitric oxide. When we hum, hmm, it increases our nitric oxide production by about 15%. So humming with your ensemble, having them do a little nose breathing, fantastic ways to ground them into the present moment, right? Great for reducing that stress. Um, okay. Um, here's another one really quickly before we leave the, the nervous system and do a bit of boundary work, but um, I'm going to invite you to take your hands. So we talked about mudra, mudra or gesture. Um, really fascinating. Our hands send messages to our brain all day, right? About our cues of safety and danger or just, you know, how our, you know, think about where your hands are. Like some people are like this a lot. Some people fists a lot, right? Those are sending messages to our brain. I'm going to invite you to just create a little heat and then palms up, sitting with your palms up and just notice. You might notice your hands. So on the external container of the body, my hands are here. And then you might start to pivot inward a little bit, just a little bit if it feels available. What's my breath feel like in my nose? And maybe are there sensations around me? What am I aware of around me? What am I aware of inside my body? And then when you're ready, I invite you to turn your palms down and notice if anything shifts for you. Does anything change in your body, mind, breath awareness? And then maybe back to palms up. and then palms down. Allowing your breath to return to whatever natural rhythm it feels comfortable, you can allow your hands to rest. So again, if we were in person, um, I would love to talk about that. Um, I'm curious, for some of us, palms up might have felt really energizing like wow like yes i'm alert i'm aware for others of us palms up you might have felt your shoulders come up it might have felt like a little like this in your body and if you haven't guessed <laughs> um, palms up is generally uh, stimulating palms up stimulates the sympathetic side palms down some of us might have felt really grounded it might have felt our we might have felt our shoulders go down we might have felt like a warmth in our abdomen for others of us, it might have felt really heavy. Like, oh, I feel disconnected. Again, going into that dorsal state of the vagus nerve where we feel just lethargic, right? Palms up, one up, one down is a really interesting practice too, just to kind of, you know, see how that, that feels. The idea behind this is, again, we have our hands outside of us. So we've got an external anchor, but then we can slowly decide, okay, where's my breath? What am I aware of? Oh, I'm aware of the lights here. Or, oh, I'm, you know, here I'm aware of my feet. A great activity to slowly pivot between inter internal and external and then become aware of, gosh, which state am I in right now? Gosh, I, I think I'm, I'm really feeling this grounded state. Um, if I'm a soloist, uh, I think of like, so I'm a, I'm a low mezzo. And, and so if I'm singing Messiah, I have to sit on stage for, you know, years before I sing. Um, sometimes it's really helpful uh, to use this gesture of groundedness when you're on stage because it's such it's like sneaky yoga. No one knows what you're doing. You're you're just kind of I'm here. Or maybe maybe if you've got some if if you've memorized a piece and you're like oh what are the words what are the words and you feel like you want your brain to come back online palms up where you're just having a little bit of that activity. Um, Again, I could, we could talk all day about hand gestures, um, but I just offer those because they're, they're so accessible. You don't even have to you know, tell students why you're doing them. You can just have them experience um, those movements. Okay, so finally today, kind of bringing this all um, together, I, I think as we talk about stress, 
how traumatic stress can live in the body, how it's often really difficult in those moments to connect with folks, particularly if we are so overwhelmed by cues of danger and not enough cues of safety in our body. Boundaries become incredibly important. Maybe you've been in a situation recently where you walk into, like you think everybody's gonna be in a mask and then you walk into the room and you're like, oh wait, nobody's wearing a mask and it's your family and this is awkward. You know, we have to make choices about where are those lines for us. As educators, students are literally in our homes, right? Now that everything, I know for some of us, we mightn't be in person, but I'm hearing a lot of from my friends that, you know, everything's online. So their students and parents feel like they have free reign to, you know, email them or text them at all hours of the night. Digital teaching comes with a lot of really interesting boundary <laughs> issues, right? And you know what those are for you. So I think one of the most important things as we think about embodying and being able to sense into what uh, those, uh, those cues of safe boundaries are for us is feeling what no feels like in our body. Now, um, this can be a bit of an intense exercise, so I invite you to um, please take care of yourself and, and know, you know if it feels like you need to just take a moment and, and a break and maybe try it later, I offer that, um, that please, please be compassionate to yourself. So I'm gonna invite you to stand again if that feels available. I'm going to give us some options um, for, for, for this uh, practice. A couple options for boundary. So the first one is this. This is a boundary mudra or a boundary gesture. My palms are really active and I'm, I'm holding it out here. Um, we're becoming aware of not only our, our body as the container, but the space around our body. It's sort of like when somebody gets a little too close, like even right now, right? Does it feel uncomfortable, right? Because I'm, I'm entering that space. So this is a great gesture. For some of us, um, it might feel really nice. So I'm gonna, I'm not sure if you can see what I'm doing here. Let's see, I'm at a wall and I'm, I'm pushing against a wall. It's sort of like I'm becoming aware of this space and the strength of the space between my body and the wall. Um, you could also do it just like this here. You could do it in a doorway if you wanted to go this way. You could put your hands in a door or um, I'm just pushing, I'm pretending the door is here, here or, you know, here, depending on, on your shoulders. Um, the last one um, that is kind of fun is as if we're holding a staff. In fact, um, this is just like a broom handle. This is kind of fun. I call it the Gandalf gesture. I don't know. It just felt right. So um, as if I'm holding this out, but you don't have to have a staff, right? So again, here with a wall here, or as, you're, as if you're holding a staff. Um, I would love for you to, to choose one of those gestures that feels comfortable. I'm gonna go like this so you can see me. And I've actually got one foot in front of the other two to really feel the space that I'm taking up. So in your gesture, start to become aware of breath moving in and out of your nose. And you might even become aware of muscles that are activating in a good way. The core, maybe the jaw. Sometimes that activation is necessary. It's not a bad thing, it's a protective gesture. Become aware of the energetic space that your body is taking up. The strength of your life force. Start to affirm this boundary sensing into what you might let in and what you definitely want to let out. And at any point, if you need to change because arms, right? You can please, please feel free to change. To affirm what remains on the outside of this gesture, we're gonna begin by saying a few no's, okay? Let's begin conversationally. So would you like coffee? No, I'm okay. So wherever you are, I'd like to just, if you can say out loud, just nope. Conversational, no. Nope. I don't need that right now. Nope. Feel how that feels in your body, just to affirm, nope, I don't need that right now. Nope. And if it feels available to you, allow the no to become louder. Maybe something more affirmatively no. No. That's not right for me at this time. No. Say it out loud if it feels available. And then what would it feel like to say absolutely not 
in the strongest possible terms, no, no, feels what that feels like in your body. Sense into how your body is affirming no in your energetic space. No. And then we're going to exhale on the sound, ah, anything that comes out to affirm that our voice has permission to take up physical and acoustic space in our energy. Inhaling, exhaling. Ha. And then finally, let us affirm ourselves in the space that we've claimed by saying our name out loud three times. I am Megan, and I invite you to notice what you feel in your body when you come to your name three times if it feels available. I am Megan. I am Megan. I am Megan. And when you're ready, bringing your awareness back. Taking some breaths in and out through the nose, just to affirm that we are in this space. And if it feels okay, I'd like us to go here. And then maybe here, just patting our cheeks. That was a really, that's a really intense practice. Really intense, really important to affirm that you have permission to take up space, but that you also, and I'm kind of like shaking it off now, that you have permission to say what comes into that space and what does not come into that space. When we are able to cultivate firmer boundaries, we're able to sense into what our body needs, we're able to sense into those cues of safety and danger, and then most importantly, we're able to provide a more compassionate, more present orienting presence for other people around us. And if we know what no feels like in our body, we can start to attune what no might look like in a student's body, right? Or a colleague's body, right? When we just need to say, you know what? Okay, then we can start to be more co-supportive, right? So I'd like to, um, I'd like to wrap up here and, and I'll be happy to take a few questions. I know we're at time, but I'd just like to end with a bit of a meta meditation just to bring us back. So. Taking a few breaths in and out through your nose, if it feels comfortable to let your eyes gaze downward or to close your eyes, or maybe there's a spot on your wall that feels really comforting to look at. I invite you to either repeat these words aloud or in your mind after me. May I be filled, filled with loving kindness. May I be safe. May I be well. May I be at ease. May you be filled with loving kindness. May you be safe. May you be well. May you be at ease. Sensing into the right shoulder and the left shoulder. The point between the eyes. Inhaling to the crown of the head, I am. Exhaling to the sits bones, here. And when you're ready, bringing your awareness back to the space. It has, um, again, been a real honor to share with you today. I encourage you to take what feels comfortable and please leave what doesn't. Um, and I know we have just a bit of time, so if anybody has any thoughts or questions, I'm happy to be here. And if you think of some later, you can email me. If everyone could uh, turn on their screens.
if they're available to do so. Any questions? I'll ask a question. Um, gosh, that was amazing. And Megan, I, you know, I usually don't have the patience um, to engage in yoga um, or uh, meditation, um, but I certainly feel uh, super grounded at the moment um, and both um, at ease, but energized, present. Yeah. Um, so that, thank you. <laughs> I'm really, I'm so grateful. Um, I'm grateful the practice I spoke to you. And um, yeah, I, I think, you know, it, it's a, how do I say this nicely? In wellness communities, again, there's this quest for calm and this quest for bliss and this idea that somehow, you know, we have to find these ideal states of being and that's just not human, <laughs> right? And so I think where how however embodiment and 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 activity and rest is available to us in any capacity, you know, I, I'm so grateful um, for you sharing that because it's so true that it's hard to find those balances right now. So just to um, uh, kind of piggyback on that, so how do you, as a practitioner, protect yourself um, from all of the things that your students bring um, and all of the energy that they bring? Um, pr I, I practice these things and I'll say this. So I have all these like gadgets. Um, I, I have all these little weird little things that, you know, I grab. So what, what you didn't see, I have a fascia ball under my foot. So while I'm doing uh, this presentation, I kind of had it there to say, I'm here, I'm here. Um, I want to say this too. Sometimes these don't work. There are times where you will do everything and you're like, I'm completely outside of my window of tolerance. I need to go grab a pillow. I'm ashamed to say, I mean, I have a 15 month old. Sometimes I just go in the bathroom and I scream. I mean, I suppose that's a way to like, you know, release it. But these are not quick fixes, right? There's, um, and, and don't trust things that are, I know as teachers, we, we like to have those. Um, but, but there are things I think we all just have to live with and know what they feel like in our own body and know, again, when I feel challenged in a, in a session or if I feel like, God, I'm so dysregulated, I just, you know, sometimes just taking that fascia ball under my foot and just coming back to the present or, um, I think more than anything, practicing these things daily as or not even these things, but you know what helps you. But having those rituals, having those practices that you're constantly um, doing, even if it's two minutes here and there, I think that's the name of the game is just becoming aware and then knowing that it's okay if it doesn't work. <laughs> work whatever that means, right? Like, because we're not trying to fix anything, we're just trying to be here. Thank you so much, Megan. We, uh, I'm so grateful. I, I was uh, hesitant to unmute myself to end this session because, because I was crying, because I was really in it, you know, and uh, just ooh, so grateful. Um, it's a, it's um, a real, um, it's, it's a deep privilege to, to hold, um, to hold this space and to hope that some of these again, practices um, are meaningful. And um, I'm really, really grateful, Amanda. Thank you for sharing. Um, let's let's all thank Megan. Wait, 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 Amanda, there, um, Amy has a question. Oh, Amy has a question. Amy, I'm so sorry. Amy, go. No worries, that's not like vital, but I wanna thank you, Megan. First, I attended one of your sessions in Pittsburgh a few years back now, and just was deeply moved by that and have incorporated some of these things with my into my work with my students. But I, especially now I'm finding this to be so important. And I'm just wondering, you know, given the implications of this virus on singers, especially on our community, how has this changed your practice and your approach to the practice um, right now? Um, it is challenge. It, uh, it's such a beautiful question, Amy. And I'm, I'm, thank you so much for your kind words. I'm trying to become more comfortable with discomfort. 
I am trying, so I am trying to widen my capacity to sit with really, really uncomfortable things. That's what it's teaching me. Um, that I have no answers that, you know, I, I, I do work actively with um, singers who have trauma, some, and we didn't talk about the difference between trauma. Not everybody who has trauma has CP, has PTSD, right? Those might be different things, different levels. Um, but that it's hard. It's just hard. And even now with students, like sometimes they don't show up sometimes, you know, the, it doesn't go to according to plan. Sometimes you feel like utter shit <laughs> as a teacher. Cause you're like, I have nothing to give you right now, except just this present moment. So I think Amy, for me, it's been, uh, my eyes have been opened to how not good I am at, at holding space for really uncomfortable things. And so for a lot of my own work right now is getting into that wobbly place with my body and, and being okay, like learning to be a little bit okay with it. Like, okay, that I have this nauseating feeling. Okay, I'm gonna sit with it, right? Um, just little, little gains here and there to widen it. Thank you, Amy. That was a brilliant question and comments. Thank you so much. Okay, everybody, the time has come. Megan, we're so grateful, everyone. Yay! Woo! Megan Durham, you are oh, such a rock star and so for real, and we needed you. We need you. The choral community needs you. Thank you so much for everything. I'm so grateful. And I, I need you. I benefit so much from your love and your joy and your inspirational. And you guys are doing it. You are in those trenches. And I send you so much love this week. Oh, thank you, Megan. You too. <laughs> All, All right. right, everybody, we are going to take a four minute break. Uh, feel free to do what you need to do in these four minutes. And we will be back here uh, with Anne Guess. So we'll see you in about four minutes, everybody. Okay.